natin ang bawat isa? Let's say, God is gracious. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not of works, but as any The reason why we're here, 
It's because we have experienced God's amazing grace, God's wonderful love towards us in Jesus Christ.
worship Him. He wants our 100% attention. He wants our all. He doesn't want any distractions. He doesn't want any competitors. What God wants is complete and total surrender to Him. And as we continue in worship, let's search our hearts. If there are anything, things that may hinder us or things that distract us this afternoon from focusing on God and giving Him our best, giving Him our own. And surrender it to the Lord. Let's give it up to Him so that this afternoon we will be able to give Him our best. We will be able to give Him our own. that we may more focus on you. This day, O oh God, we would like to say that we love you. Thank you for being our God, for being our Father, for giving all the things that we need. We don't deserve this Father, but you love us so much. And we would like to return it to you. May we bless you, O oh Lord, today. May we glorify and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, good afternoon to each one. Good afternoon. Welcome to our worship celebration once again. How are you? Good? How are you? And then say, it's great to see you today. <laughs> hey, welcome to FBIC, welcome to our, our worship celebration. We would like to uh, welcome everyone for uh, this.
this blessed time of worship. Again, we're here not because of any uh, anything else, but we're here to give glory and honor to our God. Amen? Because our God is a good God. Our God is a gracious God. And He deserves all the glory and the praise from His people. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, do we have any uh, special guests this afternoon? Ushers? Wala? First time. Wala? So welcome po sa lahat. Again, from uh, FBIC. Uh, we have a few announcements before we uh, proceed to our pastoral prayer, number one. Uh, please continue to pray for Sister Christy. Uh, I've heard from her, uh, I think, two days ago that uh, her brother has, has been brought to his resting place already, I think, last Sunday. And uh, Sister Christy would be flying back to Dubai on October 3. So let's continue to pray for them. Let's continue to pray for God's comfort. And I've seen some pictures on Facebook. I think they had some services there during the uh, burial or during the wake. So we praise and thank God for the opportunity that they were able to share God through that, you know, even in spite of that uh, sad thing that happened to the family. Uh, during our offertory, we would... I'd uh, like to request each one to let's share and let's be a part of uh, the family in this uh, trying time. Whatever we can give to help them. Uh, uh, during our offerings, during our Titan offerings, you can grab a fake promise envelope. And we would use that fake promise envelope so that we can you know, express our love and concern through giving to Sister Christy and the family. And we thank you also for the love that you have shown to... Uh, Two of our brethren last week, Sister Neri, is still here. Let's continue to pray for uh, the finalization of her paper so that she'll be able to uh, fly back to the Philippines as soon as possible. Brother JC is in the Philippines already and I think he's excited to be there. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we miss him today. But let's continue to pray for God's will in his life. And praise and thank God as, as a church, God used us to be a blessing to these uh, people. Our prayer meeting last Monday was at Al Karama. We praise God for a wonderful and blessed time. Uh, there will be, all together we were 12. And uh, this coming Monday, uh, our prayer meeting will be at Al Barsha, at uh, our, our place. So, we invite po namin kayo sa, sa dito lang po, malayo-layo na konti, Al Barsha, for our prayer meeting. We invite everyone. It's on Mondays, every Monday, starting at 8 p.m. Let's come together. Let's join our hearts together in prayer as a church. We believe that when a church prays, God works. Amen? So as a church, let's, you know, let's give uh, time to uh, this discipline of coming together and praying together as a church. On October 1, it will be at uh, Brother Albert and Sister Janice's uh, place in uh, San Paya? Silicon Valley. <laughs> Silicon Oasis. Okay, Silicon Oasis. That's on October 1, the first Monday of October. And then uh, after that, our slots are still open uh, every Monday. So if you want to host a prayer meeting, you can approach me after the service so that we can schedule our prayer meeting at your uh, specific place. If you have any prayer requests and you cannot come or join us every Monday during our prayer meeting, just write it down in a piece of paper after our service and then give it to me. And then every Monday we have a list. Okay? And we'll include your prayer request in that list so that we can pray for your specific request. Um, this coming October 27, we'll be having our family day. I think that's an Eid, uh, holidays, weekend. And we will have our family day. Uh, usually, before we always had fellowship every month, right? Uh, every last Friday of the month. But since we're out of the villa and we have no place, so uh, this will be uh, uh, the best time for us to, you know, once again strengthen our relationship with one another and fellowship with one another. I think we have agreed that the venue will be at Mamzar Beach. Uh, it's somewhere in Al Nada. Okay, so that's on October 27. Maganda daw po yung beach dun eh. Bitu Favorite beach na beach na Filipinos? Yes, okay. So that will be on October 27. Please take note of that. Uh, make sure to be uh, there during our uh, family day. Also, we are praying that we'll be able to uh, launch our 
and uh, arrange our transportation ministry. If you've seen the announcement on Facebook, uh, we're praying that we'll be able to really organize and establish key uh, transportation um, pickup points that would help our church, or especially our members, so that uh, transportation would not be a hindrance in uh, joining us in our worship celebration. So please pray for this, and if you want to uh, be a part of this, if you want to take advantage of this uh, uh, ministry, uh, just approach me after the service so that we can arrange certain things that needs uh, that needed needs arrangement so that we can prepare for this uh, transportation ministry. We're praying that we'll be able to launch it next month, October. So please uh, pray for this. If you have any suggestions or comments or ideas, let me know as well so we can start preparing for our transportation ministry. Okay. So those are all for our announcements. Again. Let's continue to pray for our target souls this year. We're praying for how many? 40, okay? And we're still 34 short. So let's pray that in these final months, we'll be able to reach out, uh, share the gospel to the lost, people will be saved, and uh, follow the Lord through water baptism and, and be a part of the church. So let's pray for 34 more. Every Monday, we're praying for this. So include this in your prayers as well. Let's also pray for our Christmas presentation preparation, just like what Brother Joy mentioned. Merry Christmas, by the way. I think it's 95 days before Christmas. 95 days, I think. So, malapit na Pasko. In the Philippines, once it reaches September, then you can start to feel the Christmas spirit, right? So, uh, advance Merry Christmas. And uh, let's start preparing for that. Pray for that. Uh, let's pray that that event will be used by the Lord so that people will get to know the true meaning of Christmas. And that is our, that having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, start praying for our second church anniversary celebration on the last Friday of the month of January next year. Now, uh, in our pastoral prayer, if you have any special requests or specific needs that you want to uh, we pray for uh, in the middle of our pastoral prayer. I would like, I would just request you to stand. I will request you to stand so that I can pray for you. Okay. In the middle of uh, our pastoral prayer. Okay? And then after our pastoral prayer, we will have our worship in heaven. Okay? Let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes, and let's pray. Oh, one more announcement. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the teachers will have the teachers of Friday school will have a training after our worship celebration. So, to all those who have been a part or who are a part of the children's ministry, please go to the uh, conference room after the service. And parents are, are also invited to join uh, in that uh, training. Okay. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh God, for once again giving us this privilege and opportunity to come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, O oh God, because you are a gracious God. You have been so good and faithful to us. And the reason why we're here is because we want to show to you how much we are grateful to you, O oh God. Because without you, we know that we are nothing. So Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. We surrender our lives to you, God. May your perfect will be done in each and every one's life. We also pray for this church. We thank you for raising up FBIC here in Dubai. We know that you have a purpose in God in uh, raising up this church, and that is to make disciples of all nations. It is our prayer, O oh God, that as we continue to exist here, that we would, you would find us faithful, O oh God, in this mission of reaching souls, reaching nations here in Dubai, so that they would have a personal relationship with you. Let us not forget, O oh God, that the ultimate purpose when you have brought us here is for you to be glorified as we reach more souls to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, O oh God, for in the past, at one point in our life, we have met the Lord Jesus Christ. You have found us in God. It is our prayer that as we continue in this life, that others will experience the same thing through the influence of our life as well. 
Lord, we dedicate this church, we dedicate the future of this church, we dedicate the plans of this church, especially this coming December, and even our preparation for our anniversary next year, January, oh God. We commit everything to you. This is your ministry, this is your work. And we know that if we would do it your way, we would bless the church as well. So Lord, we surrender everything to you, whatever you will, whatever your plan is for this church. Let it be done, oh God. We are just your instruments. We are just your people, oh God. And it is our prayer that through us, whatever your will is, whatever your plan is, it would be done. That's why we surrender ourselves to you, oh God. And Lord, I also pray for your people. We know, oh God, that living the Christian life is not easy. There's a lot of struggles. There's a lot of difficulties, oh God. Because we, primarily, we have an enemy who tries to put us down, who tries to discourage us, who tries to destroy us, oh God, and not to be able to fulfill your perfect will in our life. It's a struggle, oh God. But we thank you because you have promised to us that through Jesus Christ, we are victorious. We are victors in Jesus Christ. And one of the assurances you would never leave us, you would never forsake us, is your love towards us. The Bible says, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, from your love of God. And we claim that promise. Of God. And that's why, as a church, we come before your presence also this afternoon, surrendering to you our burden. Lord, we know that you are our Father who is concerned about our needs, who is concerned about our welfare, who is concerned about our problems and worries in life. Lord, as your children would stand this afternoon, hear our prayers. If you have a burden, a need, a special request that you would like to bring up to the Lord, I would like to request you to stand. And I will be praying. Lord, these are your children. We know, oh God, that you know our hearts. And you know the hearts of your people this afternoon. We thank you for the promise that you are our God who hears our prayers. You are our God who is concerned about our needs, our burdens. And Lord, we dedicate these requests unto you, oh God. Lord, first of all, we pray for your perfect will. We pray that in your own time, in your own way, O oh God, you would accomplish your will in the lives of these people. It is my prayer that you would give them, O oh God, sensitivity as well, to see you at work in their lives. That they would not depend on their own understanding. That they would acknowledge you in everything that they do. So that you would be able to lead them in the path that is right the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, I pray for your blessing upon these people. I pray for power of God that comes from you. I pray for special favor that comes from you. May it be, Lord, that even through these hard times that they are probably experiencing in life, that they will learn to trust in you the more. That they will learn to depend on you the more. And they will learn to worship you glorify you, no matter what the circumstances. We thank you, Lord, for we can always come to you and ask for your help. And this time, O oh God, as we would like to honor you once again through our giving, through our tithes, and our offerings, we pray, O oh God, that this will be a sweet-smelling aroma to your sight. We'll be able to worship you truly for our giving. We will be able to cheerfully give as you have a purpose in our hearts. And I ask that you will continue to bless your people, O oh God, here in the Bible, so that we will be able to continue to accomplish your perfect will and be a blessing to others as well. We give you all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all stand. Let's sing our doxology.
Praise God from whom all blessings Ready? Sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Good afternoon, church. That is good. And all the time. That is good. Welcome to FBIC once again. So before we go into our listening to the God's word, are you ready to listen to our, our God? Are you ready to listen to His word this afternoon? Uh, before we do that, we need uh, as a review of our last week message. We learned that generous giving is God's way to support the needs of the church. We learned our motive in generous giving, number one, is the practice. We learned that the believers in the old times sell and share the, their possession to each other. And then we learned the purpose of, give, of giving is, number one, is they gave to support the leaders. And secondly, they gave to supply the needs of the people. And last week, we also learned about the principle Generous giving is God's way to supply the needs of the needy Christian. So that's last week's uh, message. So in, in addition, the first question to ask is not, what do I need to give? But how can, I, how can my giving reflect something of God's love for me? So that's giving. There's, a, there's some uh, myths and truths about stewardship. Uh, let me test you on this. So, uh, the meaning of, literally meaning of stewardship is holding in trust and managing the estate of others. So, that's the literal meaning of stewardship. So, tell me whether this is a myth or a truth. A type, a type, 10% is God's. Is it a myth or a truth? We say it's truth. We say it's a myth. It's a myth. The truth is, all 100% belongs to God. That's the truth. Okay, myth or truth? Giving the church, giving to the church is giving to God. Truth? Myth? We say myth. <laughs> it's a myth. The truth is, using all our resources faithfully is giving to God. It's not only the, the, the amount of the money that we give, but it's all the resources that we use. That's including our talents. Everything is belong to God. Okay, next one. Myth or truth? Stewardship is our responsibility as the church. Myth or truth? Myth or truth? It's true. Stewardship is our responsibility as a church. We are the church. Myth or truth? Stewardship is about money. Meet or two. Yes, it's not all about money, right? It's not all about money. Meet or two. Financial stewardship encourages uh, equal sacrifice. Meet or two. Equal sacrifice. <laughs> It's the truth, yes. Financial stewardship encourage equal sacrifice. So it's, we're all equal, so we sacrifice everything is equally to each other. Meet or truth, give until it hurts. Truth or meet? We say meet. All, all truth? <laughs> it's a meet. Truth is give until it feels good. <laughs> okay, lastly. Meet our truth. We give as we prosper. Meet our truth. Yes, it's me. So we give as we believe. 
That's the truth. Okay, another one. Give to God what is right, not what is left. Okay. God looks at the heart, not the hand. The giver, not the gift. Amen? Okay. May I request to stand as we read our scripture reading. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 7. Second Corinthians 8, 1 to 7. Let's read it responsibly. I'll start with uh, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. But for to their power a bare record, yea, at and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Verse 5, And this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. Uh, all together in verse 7. Therefore, as ye have come in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, in all diligence, and all in all your love to us, see that ye have come in this grace also. May the Lord add blessing to read this word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for this privilege. Thank you, Father God, for bringing us this afternoon, Father God, to understand and listen to your word, O Lord, into our hearts. Father, thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Also, Father, ask that you cleanse us, O Lord, in, a, in, in all our sins, O Lord, that we might be acceptable unto your sight this afternoon as so, well. We also, Father, that you bless our pastors. We want to deliver the message once again. We pray for the wisdom that you are giving to him, O Lord, and we pray that we speak in our hearts this afternoon. Thank you, Father, we commit everything to you. In the mighty name of the Lord, the Jesus Christ. your Bibles, your faith diaries, your sermon notes, and your pens, and uh, we'll, we will be studying God's Word uh, this afternoon. Now open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is actually our main text for our series, although we had some introductory uh, messages for the past two weeks so that we'll be able to uh, have that kind of excitement when it comes to uh, studying this particular theme. As I have said before, uh, when we talk about um, stewardship or generous giving, some Christians are you know, afraid of that because they think that they would you know, lose something. I mean, actually, once we learn what Christian giving is all about, as we have said before, it's actually the secret for God's abundant blessings to us. So I hope and pray that as we have uh, looked into this theme so far for the past two weeks it, you know, gave us that excitement to learn more about generous Christian giving. Now let's just have a short review um, of our uh, messages for the past two weeks. First of all, if you remember the first Friday we talked about the mandate uh, to give generously uh, based on uh, Luke chapter 6 verse 38 give and it shall be given to you and uh, we've said, we've uh, we had two principles out of that uh, message that we have heard. Principle number one, generous Christ Christian giving is a test of a disciple's obedience to Christ. We can see that in the Word of God, to give is a commandment from the Lord. So when we give, we actually obey God's command. So Christian giving, generous Christian giving is a test of obedience. Once we uh, learn to give generously, then it's an act of obedience or Christ, uh, obedience to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now secondly, God tremendously rewards generous Christian giving. We have seen also the promise of the Lord, that once we learn to give generously, God will ultimately bless those who truly give. Okay? That's the promise of the Lord. We cannot deny that. We can find that in this word that God is a God who blesses His people. But the secret to God's uh, blessings 
The pipeline to God's blessings is what? Generous Christian giving. The more you give, the more you will receive. Now, last week, Brother Carlo mentioned this earlier, we talked about the motive in Christian, generous Christian giving. Uh, we've said that uh, generous Christian giving is God's way to support the needs of the church, as we have seen in the example of the early church in the book of Acts. And at the same time, generous giving is God's way to supply the needs of the needy Christians. So, the reason why the early church gave generously, as we can find in the book of Acts, is because not only they supported their leaders, that is a biblical principle that we can find in the Word of God, but also we can see in the Bible that uh, one of the purposes why the Christians gave generously during that time is not just to support the church, but to support the needs of believers, not just within their church, but even you know, in the other churches. And we can, we would, we would be looking to that in our study this afternoon. That's why if you look into Acts chapter 4, verse 34, the Bible says that there was not a needy person among them. That's one of the wonderful characteristics of the early Christian church. For as many as were owners of lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Okay, so um, these are the principles that we've learned last week when it comes to uh, generous giving. And as a church, I said earlier that, you know, I thank God that as a church we were able to truly respond to, uh, to these challenges. And last week we have proven that. Uh, we have given generously. And we praise and thank God for the privilege and opportunity to be able to help those who are in need. And also today, as we give to uh, one of our sisters who, who is in need, it's also a, a privilege and opportunity for us to be a blessing to them. And as a church, we need to be concerned not just about you know, the needs of the church, but we should also be concerned about the poor and the needy, as we can find in the scriptures. Why? Because as I said last week, God is concerned about the poor and the needy. If you were looking to the Old Testament, even all the way up to the New Testament, God gave specific commands on how we are to treat the people who are needy, the people who are poor, and we should never, never, ever neglect them. Now, if you would look into 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the context here. In asking for, for support from the believers in Corinth is not because of uh, the need of the church, but because of the second one, which is what? Supplying the needs of needy Christians. Okay? Um, if you will look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you will find here the model, excuse me, the model that Paul mentioned that we should follow when it comes to generous. Christian giving. This passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 is the heart and soul of Christian giving. And we would be we would be learning a lot from these passages concerning a Christian giving. Now, first of all, let me just give you a little background of this passage. First of all, let's discuss the crisis here. What's the crisis? Now, in this particular passage, the Apostle Paul is write, writing to the Corinthian church, uh, Corinthian believers, and he is encouraging them to support and meet the needs of uh, a certain group of brethren, not within their church, but meeting the needs of the poor saints in other churches, particularly in the church of Jerusalem during this time. So if you would look into the context Paul is making an appeal to the Corinthians. Help the church in Jerusalem. Support those who are in need in Jerusalem. Make significant gifts to them because they are in need. And um, the Apostle Paul encouraged the Corinthian believers to give generously by showing to them or sharing to them the example of the Macedonian churches who supported and gave to the needs of the church in Jerusalem as well. He encouraged them by giving them a living example when it comes to generous giving. And that is through the model or the example of 
the Macedonian churches. That's why if you would look at your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you. We would like to let you know. About what? About the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now, before we look into the example of the Macedonian churches and learn how they were able to give generously, let's first look into the reasons, okay? Why the Apostle Paul requested for support and help of the believers in the church of Corinth, okay? Basically, so Paul asked for support for the Jerusalem church. Now, the Jerusalem church, the very first church that was established in the New Testament, okay, had a problem. What was their problem? They had to face extreme poverty. Now, if you would look into the church of Jerusalem, the church was not a wealthy church. It was not an upper class church, but instead, a lot of the believers in that congregation were impoverished or were poor. Now, there are a few reasons why, you know, the members or the believers in the church of Jerusalem were poor. And we will try to discuss some of those reasons, reasons this afternoon. It would serve as a background for our text for us to be able to truly understand how the Macedonians truly gave generously. Now, first of all, We'll try to answer the question, why was the church in Jerusalem poor? Why were they in need? Okay, well, first of all, because most of the believers during this time in Jerusalem were all, most of them were what? Pilgrims. Now, if you would look into the history of Israel, a lot of Jews were scattered all over the world, okay? And uh, these, these are what we call uh, Hellenistic Jews, uh, meaning Jews from uh, the Gentile nations. What they do is that every time there will be a great feast in Jerusalem, all of the Jews will gather in Jerusalem and celebrate that feast. Okay? So, uh, if you would open your Bibles in Acts chapter 2, we looked into this last week, and we'll look into it again this afternoon. Acts chapter 2 Right after the Holy Spirit came to those 120 in the upper room, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that when the Spirit came, what happened? They spoke in what? Tongues. Okay? They spoke in tongues. And all of those who were in Jerusalem, the different languages, the different nations, heard them in their, and understood them in their own native language. So it's like this. I'm speaking in Tagalog, probably one of you is Malaysian, Singaporean, uh, what else, American, uh, Russian, German. I'm speaking in Tagalog and yet you're understanding me in your own language. Okay? That's what, you know, speaking in tongues uh, here. This was happening here as mentioned in Acts chapter 2. Now it says in verse number 5 up to verse number 13, let's read it. Acts chapter 2, verses 5 to 13. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And, came, and when this sound occurred, the multitudes came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all of these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born. Parthians and Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever, whatever could this mean? Others said they are full of new wine. But if you will start to look at chapter 14, Peter stood up and Peter preached. And he gave a very powerful sermon during this time. And if you would look at, uh, at the end of that preaching, 
in verse number 38, okay, of verse number 40, verse number 40, it says here, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. That's the last part of Peter's preaching. Verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day, how many were saved? 3,000 souls were added to them. Okay, so that's what happened okay, during this time. Uh, after uh, a lot of Jews migrated, uh, uh, no, uh, traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, um, when Peter preached during this time, a lot of them got saved. And if you would go into Acts chapter 4, verse number 4, I think 5,000 were what? Saved uh, through the ministry of the church in Jerusalem. Not to mention that the Bible says that every day souls are being added to the church. Souls are being added to the church. And once they got saved, what happened? Well, if you will look at verses number 42 up to 47, those who were saved, just imagine that, those 3,000 souls, and those who were added to the church daily, who got saved, what did they do? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now, take note of that. They continued. Okay? Now, just try to imagine the picture here. Let's say, for example, we're here in Dubai, FBIC. Now, probably there's an event here in Dubai, and then thousands of people came here to watch that event. Now, during that event, you know, as a church, we tried to share the gospel and preach the gospel. And let's say 5,000 were saved in one week. Wow. Of our evangelistic campaign. Okay? And we baptized 5,000 during that week. Now, after that, those who came here to stay for just one week suddenly decided to stay for another two weeks. But they're only prepared to stay to the, in Dubai well, financially for just one week. So what would we do if they decided to stay? I, I want to stay for two more weeks because I want to learn more. I want to learn more about this newfound faith. I want to learn more, more about this Jesus Christ. I want to learn more about what the Bible says. What would we do as a church? Would we say to them, oh, no, 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 we just want you to be saved. Go back to your homes. Okay, go home, go home. We don't want you to be here. What would we do? We would what? We would accommodate them so that they could be taught and they could learn more about their newfound faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what happened to the church in Jerusalem. A lot of the Jews who were saved during this time didn't want to go back to their uh, respective places. They wanted to stay in Jerusalem for a while because they wanted to learn more. They wanted to continue in their newfound faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, you know what happened? The small believers in Jerusalem, you know what they did? They tried to sell everything that they had. They tried to sell their possessions. And that's how it's about. They gave it at the apostles' feet so that somehow the needs of all those people who were there, just imagine, 3,000, probably 10,000, 8,000. The needs, those who are in need, their needs will be what? Will be met. But imagine, if this goes on, not just for one week, not just for two weeks, three weeks, but a month, two months, three months, what would happen? Their resources would be what? Mauubos din. Yung lupa na binibenta nila, mauubos din yun, darating na ano, mawawala din sila. That's why, those who were rich during this time, came to a point that they were also in need. Why? Because they were able to sell everything that they had. And so to support the believers who are in need during that time in the church in Jerusalem. Okay, so, so that's one of the reasons why the church in Jerusalem was a very poor church. A lot of them were in need because a lot of them decided to stay in Jerusalem and learn more about the Word of God. Okay, now number two, another reason is that because of the persecuted Jews, okay, there were also some who were living in Jerusalem who got persecuted because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So because they became Christians, 
their faith, because of their faith, they were hated, they were excommunicated from the synagogues, they were rejected, they lost their jobs, they lost their businesses, they lost their, the source of their living just because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? Uh, wala dito. Sabi ng isang commentator, Jerusalem is the holy city. There's no question about it. And it is the most sacred place on the earth to devout Jews. It is there that they are more concerned about their religion than anywhere else. It is there that their exclusivism reaches its pinnacle, their legalism, and their animosity toward anyone who rejects Judaism. So if you're someone and you reject Judaism, what would they do? They would persecute you. They would hate you. Okay? And that's what happened to the believers, uh, early Christians during that time. A lot of them were persecuted. A lot of them lost their jobs because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyways, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ said this to His disciples. Uh, he said in John 15, 20, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, what did Jesus say? They will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So as Christians, they expected that they would be what? They would be persecuted. John 16, 2 says, They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. Matthew 19, 29 says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So, part of the believer's life during that time is what? Persecutions. And a lot of the Jews, and the, a lot of the believers in uh, the church in Jerusalem experience this kind of persecution. Then lastly, this also contributed to the situation of the church in Jerusalem, the politics or the government. Jerusalem was under the Roman government during this time. And you know what the Roman government would try to do? They would try to take advantage once they possess you. They would maximize all of your resources. They would get all of your resources to their advantage. Okay, That's why Jerusalem, Judea was a very poor area during that time because the Roman government took everything. They maximized everything for the advantage of the empire. Okay? So, uh, these things contributed to the need of the church in, in Jerusalem. That's why the Apostle Paul had a burden for this church. So what the Apostle Paul did was that during his third missionary journey, one of his purposes is to raise funds for this church in Jerusalem. Every time he would visit a church, he would present the need, the challenge, uh, to help the church in Jerusalem. And the Macedonian churches okay, responded and became a model when it comes to generous giving. Now, so that's just a brief background so that you would see the great need or the situation of the church in, in Jerusalem. So it was no ordinary need, but it was a great need. And in light of this background, Paul presented the challenge to the Corinthian believers and a lot of other churches during that time. What was the challenge? The challenge that Paul gave to the Corinthian believers was for them to be a part of the great privilege of helping meeting the needs of the church in Jerusalem. And how did he present the need? As I said earlier, he shared the example of the Macedonian churches. Now, question. Who are these Macedonian churches? Why were they so commended when it comes to generous giving? Well, let's look, try to uh, look into what the Apostle Paul said about them. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Well, first of all, let's identify who are these churches in Macedonia. Basically, there are three churches in Macedonia being mentioned here by the Apostle Paul. The church in Philippi, the church in Thessalonica, and the church in Berea. Okay? So, the blue churches yung binabangin dito when Paul mentions Macedonian churches, what are those? Church in 
Philippi, where the epistle of the book of Philippians was written to the book, uh, the church in Thessalonica. Na kung saan sinulat yung book of what? First and Second Thessalonians, and the church in Berea. Na kung saan sinulat yung First and Second Berea. Wala, wala. Okay. So those are the Macedonian churches being mentioned here. Now, the Macedonian churches, just like Jerusalem, was under the rule of the Roman Empire. So as I have said earlier, what the Roman Empire would do, they would try to take advantage of a certain place and use all of their resources to their own advantage. So that's why the Macedonian uh, region was not really a rich area. Okay? Um, sabi nila, although the place was rich with gold, silver, salt, and timber, the Roman Empire impoverished them and took advantage of all of their resources. That's why uh, this area was brought into poverty because the Roman Empire used all of their wonderful or great resources. That's why, if you would notice, Paul described the Macedonians here as... Look at verse number 2. How did Paul describe the Macedonian church? They were in what? In deep poverty. In other translations, the Bible says they were in extreme poverty. So if you would look at the condition of the Macedonian churches, they were not just poor, but they were what? Extremely poor. They were deeply poor. Poor. And not only that, they were also experiencing what? Afflictions. Look at verse number 2. He, Paul said that in a great trial of affliction, or in a great testing of affliction, and Paul said they were also what? Poor. Extremely poor. So in other words, when Paul presented the, ch the challenge to the Macedonian churches, of the need of the church in Jerusalem, even though they were also in need. Supposedly, they have the right to be supported as well. Instead of asking for support from Paul, they what? They participated and they gave generously to the need of the church in Jerusalem. They could have said to the Apostle Paul, you know what, Paul? Just like the church in Jerusalem, we're also poor. As a matter of fact, we're extremely poor and we're also suffering afflictions. We're experiencing afflictions so probably because of their faith, they were being persecuted. We are in a difficult time. And since Paul, you're going around churches and soliciting funds for those who are in need, why don't you include our church as the recipient of those help so that, you know, somehow uh, other churches can participate in aiding for the need of our church as well. But they did not say that. But instead, they said to Paul, Paul, we want to take part and we would support the church in Jerusalem. Now, notice how the Apostle Paul described their giving. Look at verse number 2. It says there that when they gave, okay, they gave out of what? Joy. Actually, uh, an adjective was used there, the abundance of their joy. So they gave with joy, and not just, I know, an ordinary kind of joy, but they were abounding in joy when they gave to the needs of the church in Jerusalem. And their giving overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Verse number 3, if you will look at verse number 3, the Bible says that they gave beyond their means, or they gave beyond their ability. Meaning they were able to give more than they were, they gave more than they were able to, to give. And then verse number four, they even asked and begged Paul, Paul, please receive our gift. Probably Paul knew because, you know, they were poor and they were also in need. You know what? It's okay. Uh, don't take part in this. You know, let the other churches who are, you know, doing well support the needs of Jerusalem. But they said, no, Paul, please, we beg you, receive our gift. For the church in Jerusalem. Now what's the challenge that Paul is presenting to the church in Corinth and to us also today? What Paul is saying here is this. 
if the Macedonian believers who were extremely poor and who were greatly suffering, if they were able to support and give to the need of the church in Jerusalem. So Paul was saying to the Corinthian believers, how much more you believers in Corinth would be able to give generously. The extreme affliction and poverty of the Macedonian believers did not stop them from exercising generous Christian. The principle here today is, let's read it all together. Ready? Begin. Again, let's read it all together with uh, enthusiasm. Ready? Begin. Remember that afflictions and abasement are never an obstacle or a hindrance to generous Christian giving. One commentator said, even the poor are called to relieve those who are poorer than themselves and the afflicted to comfort those who are more afflicted than they are. The poor and afflicted churches of Macedonia felt this duty and therefore came forward to the uttermost of their power to relieve their more impoverished and afflicted brethren in Judea. So in other words, our financial status, our economic situation, or even our suffering condition are not a hindrance for a Christian to be able to what? To practice generous giving. In other words, it's, you know, generous Christian giving is not just for the rich, but it's for every Christian. No matter what your situation is, you can exercise generous Christian giving. Um, no, we can give generously. And that's the truth that we can see here. We all have the ability to give generously. You and I have the ability, the capacity to exercise generous Christian giving. If the Macedonians were able to give generously, then we can, and we will be able to generously give. As a matter of fact, you know what? Actually, if, if you have much, you have a greater responsibility when it comes to generous Christian giving. Sabi nga natin, di ba? With great power comes great responsibility. With much resources, we have what? More responsibilities as far as generous giving is concerned. The more that the Lord has entrusted to us, the more that God expects from, from us. Okay? So, when it comes to generous Christian giving, you see, God, it's not about the amount. Brother Carlo mentioned that earlier. God is not concerned about how much we give. But God is concerned about what? It's not about the, the hand, but it's about the what? The heart. It's not about the gift, but it's about the who? The giver. Okay? God is concerned about that. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. And we'll see here a very perfect example. That as far as God is concerned, He's not concerned about the amount that we give to Him. Mark chapter 12. Verse 41. This is a very familiar <coughs> passage in the Bible. Let's start reading from verse 41 up to verse 44. 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. The one poor widow came and threw in two mites which makes a quadrants or a penny. So he called his disciples to himself and he said to them, Assuredly, I say this, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. Why? Because Jesus said in verse 44, For they all put in out of their abundance. But she, pertaining to the widow, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole life. And this is the principle that we can see. Okay? Amount is never the headline in generous giving. When we talk about generous giving, we don't talk about the amount. Okay? Hindi porque 
ah, ito si ganto nagbigay ng ganto kalaking ama. Hindi ibig sabihin na that he gave generously already. Okay? It's not about the amount that we're talking about here. When, you see, when God looks at our giving, okay, he, doesn't, he does not headline the amount. But He's more concerned about what? Our heart when we give. Look at our passage. Did Jesus commend the rich people who gave large sums of money? No, right? Who did He commend? The poor widow who gave how much? Two mites or one penny. And she gave everything that she had. Her whole livelihood, Jesus said. But Jesus commended the widow's giving because she gave generously. To Jesus, who was the one who truly gave? Was it the rich or the widow? And of course, the widow. How much did she give? Two months. So is it about the amount? No. Okay. But Jesus looked at the heart. Anonymous said, The world measures success by the size of your bank account. God measures success by the size of your life. How's our hearts? Meron ba tayong enlargement of the heart? Okay. You see, God is not concerned about the amount that we give, but God is concerned about our attitude in giving. God looks into our hearts, not our pockets. When we give. And that is the second truth that we can see here. We need to have a right attitude in order to give generously. The Macedonian believers were commended by the Apostle Paul, not because they gave a very big amount, Okay? But they were commended because of their attitude in giving. They gave with joy. They were abundant in joy when they gave. And it overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. And as I said earlier, they even begged Paul, Paul, please allow us to take part in supporting the need of the church in Jerusalem. You know what? I will try to close with this. The point is, you and I, can be a generous giver. It doesn't matter what your situation is, it doesn't matter what your status is in life, but the, the fact is, God has given us the ability to give generously. You can be a generous giver. So I can be a generous giver. I can be a generous giver. I can be a generous giver. So, we all have the ability to give. Why? Remember, God does not look at the amount, but in our attitude when we give. And it is in our attitude when we give, where generosity is special. If our hearts are right before God, then we can give generously. So, I will be a I will be a generous giver. How many of you know J.L. Craft? He is the, uh, uh, the head of Kraft Cheese Corporation. Kraft Cheese, Kraft Cheddar Cheese. He's a Christian. He, uh, it was said that he approximately gives 25% of his enormous income to Christian causes and churches. Okay, 25%. And then he said, the only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I have given to the Lord. Then J.D. Rock, Rockefeller said, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars if ever I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary, which was $1.50. So what's the point here? The point is this. It's not what you do with the million if fortune should be earned your, uh, should earn you a lot, but what you are doing at present with a dollar and quarter. In other words, what are you doing with what God has entrusted to you right now? Are we faithful stewards? Are we good stewards of the Lord Jesus Christ? How are we doing with the resources that God has entrusted to us now? Are we using our resources wisely for God? Brethren, if we cannot give generously if we are not faithful stewards of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't say, 
Sige Pastor, I'll be generous in giving when I pag nanalo ako sa loto. When I have my first millions, then I can give generously. You know what? That's not gonna happen. Why? It's not about you now. Okay? It starts with the attitude. Remember what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money at the same time. Whom are we serving? Are we serving God? Or are we servants of the riches of this world? James A. Lawless said, Christian stewardship is more than the management of things. It is the refusal to let things manage us. Steve Goodyear said, People who live well are experts at giving. They give their money, they give their time, they share wisdom and their skills, they quickly say yes when asked for help. For them to give is to love, to love is to give. It's a formula for a successful life. Do you want to be a successful Christian? Do you want to be a successful person? Then learn to give generously. Do you want to be a generous giver? Do you want to be just like the Macedonian believers who gave generously with abundance of joy? Do you want to be a faithful steward of God? All you need to do is to offer yourselves to the Lord. You know why the Macedonians were able to give generously in spite of their condition? If you will look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, we'll close with this. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 5, what was said there by the Apostle Paul? And not only as we hope, but what? But they first, what? Gave themselves to whom? To the Lord. The reason why they were able to give generously is because they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. You can be a generous. Let us be a generous giver. Let God be your master. Let God be your Lord. Let Him be our manager. Let Him direct our life. And all we need to do is to what? Offer everything to Him. No matter how big or how small our resources may be, offer to Him yourselves. Offer to Him your resources. Then we can be generous giver. That's the secret of the Macedonian believers. They first gave themselves. Let's all stand and let's close our services after me. Let's just have bow down our heads and let's close our eyes. Let us reflect on the truths that we have learned this afternoon. Again, the secret in having a successful Christian life, the secret in being a generous giver, is firstly offering ourselves to the Lord. We cannot give generously unless we have fully, fully given our life to Him. What are some areas of our lives? that we're having a hard time surrendering to the Lord? What are the aspects of our lives that we have not yet completely surrendered to? You know what? Unless we give, raise up our hands and say, Lord, I give up. You do your work in me. God can never do so. So let's search our hearts this afternoon. It doesn't matter and God's not concerned about your past. God can use your past, no matter how ugly that is. And turn it into a bright future if you will just surrender it. God can turn a mess into something that is very useful if you will just surrender it. So whatever it is, search your hearts and surrender it. Thank you.
RCA building, there's this one statue. Uh, it's, a, it's a statue of Atlas. And uh, you know Atlas? And he is holding, the statue is like, uh, he's holding the world on his shoulders. Just like that. All his muscles are, were strained. And it's like, you know, he was having a hard time carrying the full world on his shoulders. Opposite of that building is St. Peter's Cathedral. You know what? Someone said inside that cathedral, there's this small shrine, and there's this uh, statue of baby Jesus, probably about seven or eight years old. And you know what? He is holding the world. So the palm of his hand. You know what? One writer said, what's the point? We have a choice. We can carry the world on our shoulders, or we can say, I give up, Lord. Here's my life. I give you my world. So are you willing to give up your world? Give up your life to me? Or still try to carry the world on your shoulders? You know what? If you let God carry our life, our world, then life will be wonderful. Life will be easy. Life will be great. All we need to do is to surrender it. Surrender our lives. Let's see the same. spoken to us. You have spoken to each one's heart. And we know that you are knocking at the door of our hearts. Asking us to be generous givers. But we cannot be generous givers of God unless we fully surrender our lives to you. So Lord, search the hearts of your people. There are any aspect of our lives that we cannot you know, fully yield to you yet. We pray, oh God, that this afternoon you would just break our hearts, that you would make us realize that we cannot carry the world on our shoulders. We cannot do it on our own. All we need to do is just to surrender everything to you, oh God, and let you do the work for us. Once you do the work for us, O God, everything will be according to your perfect will 
according to your perfect plan. We're sorry, though, God, for the many times that we have tried to do things on our own. But it is our prayer, oh God, starting from now, as we go through another week, we will be sensitive to your leading of us. That we will be able to fully surrender every aspect of our lives to you. Because in the first place, you have not withheld anything from us. You have given your whole life to us. So Lord, we ask that you would make us generous givers, Just like the Macedonian believers. It doesn't matter where we are right now. What matters is how we would respond to your invitation. I pray for your people. I pray for your mighty work in the life of each other. And Lord, as we surrender our lives to you, enable us, empower us, O God, so that we'll be able to fulfill the commitment and promises that we have given to you. The Lord bless you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in glory, majesty, dominion, and authority both now and forever. Amen. Amen.